is there going to be a coming world leader? The Bible says that there will be. Hi, welcome to a special edition of The Grand Adventure. I'm John Leffler, and here with me is uh, Chuck Missler. Usually every day on The Grand Adventure, you'll hear Bible studies and other teaching and commentary by Chuck. But uh, every once in a while, usually for a week, we take time out and look at world events in the light of biblical prophecy and biblical prophecy in the light of world events. It's a two-way street, actually. This week, we're talking about the coming world leader. Some people call him Antichrist. Uh, Chuck has chosen to call him the coming world leader because he has a much broader uh, I would say persona. How's that? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> if there's such a thing as a persona for Antichrist. But there really is an elaborate description about who this man is going to be and what he's going to do. Yesterday we were talking about uh, his characteristics. And today we're going to talk about the rule that uh, he will employ, what people will see as he begins to unfold what he's doing. He's going to be an expert in deceit. And in fact, he's going to deceive the whole world. The only protection to not being deceived is to be personally in Jesus Christ because it's not going to be an intellectual protection. Uh, he's, going to de- he's going to deceive the most intellectual people around. Uh, the only protection is spiritual, and that is to be in Jesus Christ. You know, I think as we sort of explore this subject, I think it's probably appropriate for us to return to one of the primary passages because I see you know, time can easily get away on us. And, and uh, Revelation 13 probably is one of the key passages because it mentions the fact that there's really two guys. The first guy, sometimes called the first beast, Revelation 13, it, it opens the, uh, the, the chapter. And I stood on the sand of the sea, John says, and saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, this is a phrase, of course, we recognize from Daniel 7 and elsewhere. And upon his horns, ten crowns. And uh, upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. In other words, he's going to be very anti-godly in his posture here. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And, and so these animal idioms, of course, are also emergent from uh, Daniel chapter 7. It says, and the dragon gave him his power. And the dragon has been identified in the previous chapter, chapter 12, verse 9, as none other than Satan. So Satan gives him his power. And by the way, one of the things we'll recognize as we go through here, don't be surprised if he has supernatural power. That's something we're not really ready for as a world. And yet, that's clearly what the scripture lays out. Now, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. That authority comes from Satan himself, who one of his titles is, of course, the God of this world. In verse 3, he says, And I saw one of his heads as though it were wounded to the death. His deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Now, many scholars have some different views on this, but I personally, for a variety of technical reasons, believe it's a very literal wound of a literal guy making literal assertions. So uh, the term beast is sometimes used of his empire, sometimes of him personally, but I believe this illusion is not that of a system or an organization, but him personally. So is he dead and comes back? That apparently is the picture. Now, whether he's literally dead or he thinks he's dead is a technicality. Mm -hmm. He does, uh, the whole world is amazed when he returns to life. Verse 4 says, and they worship the dragon who gave the power unto the beast. The world is going to worship Satan, whether they realize it or not. And, uh, who, uh, and uh, they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? In other words, by the time this is in view here in Revelation 13, he is militarily um, supreme on the planet Earth. And, there, and we'll discover from Daniel 11, verse 41, there's only one country in the world that escapes his rule, and that's Jordan for some strange reasons. That's in 11, and Daniel 11 makes that allusion. But anyway, there was, in verse 5 in Revelation 13 says, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. There again is this strange allusion, Mr. Big Mouth. And uh, power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. Here again is this uh, half-week allusion. And he opened his mouth, here again in verse 6, uh, in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And, of course, the pre-trib tribes see this as obviously being post-rapture, and I do too, by the way, but there's no, that's not a proof of it, but just an incidental remark. Mm-hmm. Verse 7, And was given unto him to make war with the saints. Now, this is interesting because in Matthew 16, Jesus says that uh, the gates of hell would not prevail against the church, but here it says this guy is going to make war with the saints and to overcome them, which either is a contradiction or it means that these saints are post-church, is one, uh, one view. The power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And there is, of course, a footnote exception in terms of the case of uh, Jordan, as I, as I mentioned. And it says, and all them that dwell upon the earth. Now, notice the book of Revelation has a unique group of people, a distinctive group, called the earth dwellers, those that dwell upon the earth. All they that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And that's the key question all of our lives right now is are you uh, written in the, in the Lamb's book of life? 
So this is the first beast of Revelation 13. The key point being in verse 11, we find another guy surface. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. In other words, the authority of, of the lamb. Mm -hmm. And he spoke like a dragon. So even though he, he appears to have a religious authority, uh, he, has, he speaks, he's empowered by Satan. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. So he has somehow, derivatively apparently, the power of the political leader that, that was mentioned first. And he causes the earth and those that dwell on it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Here, that wound thing becomes an identity. Several times in the book of Revelation, that's used as an identity of the first guy. Let me question you. Does that yeah. mean the second beast is a political figure or a religious figure? No, I believe he's a religious leader. In other words, he's very powerful politically, probably. Right. But the point is his role is to cause the world to worship this political leader. But the first beast is not Satan either. It's, we're talking about the world. There's three guys. Satan okay. powers them both. The first guy is a political leader. That okay. rules the world. He's militarily powerful. No one can make war with him. He's, he's uh, in a political sense, numero uno. That's the beast. The beast. The right. first beast of Revelation 13. The second beast, which is who is called elsewhere in the scripture. Subsequently, he's going to be called the false prophet. Okay. He apparently is a religious leader, an aide de camp, if you will, of, the, of numero uno. That he's very powerful, too, as we'll see shortly. Uh, he's going to cause the whole world to worship the first, uh, the, the, that is, the political leader. It says, he doeth great wonders. Now, that word in the scripture is used of miracles, by the way. So, he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. That's pretty wild. And everybody has different conjectures what that may imply. But in any case, it's, a, it's put here as a wonder, as, an, as, a, as a signifying uh, capability. And he, was, he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast that had the wound by a sword and did live. Now here again, see in verse 14, it again uses this head wound thing as an identity of the first guy. And he hath power to give life unto the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast uh, should uh, be killed. And he causes all, both small and great and rich and poor, free and enslaved, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now, incidentally, this, uh, it's interesting that in the Torah, we have uh, a, a proscription, a, a prohibition of taking any mark on one's skin. If you're going to be obedient to the Bible, you can't do that. And it's an, perhaps in anticipation of this very uh, political maneuver. You know, you're talking about tying up the, the monetary system and the, the global governance system. On, uh, not tomorrow, but the day after, we'll be talking about uh, how that could possibly come about. It's going to be interesting to see conceivably how we make the, the transition from where we are now globally to the description that the Bible's providing of that. Wall Street Journal had an article talking about the cashless society that's coming. Ten years ago, uh, people who talked about that were sort of considered kooks. Why, it'll never happen. People will never give up cash. Uh, they always want the, the jingle jangle of change in their pocket and dollar bills. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, we see the world moving uh, rapidly into a, a controlled currency globally. Uh, the technology is, is in front of us, and, and not just in terms of the chips we talked about, but the whole idea that in today's world, the electronic transfers are the lifeblood of the world economies. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's a gigantic machine that's getting increasingly integrated. Not, not only that, uh, there was a recent thing uh, a few days ago that said that we want to change our $100 bills abroad. In other words, we're going to change the $100 bills because of the fact that uh, they're being counterfeited so well. And uh, the Russians are using these as their, um, their savings because the ruble is devaluating so badly that they convert their savings into $100 bills. So they're freaking out now. Yeah, it's interesting that there's more U.S. currency abroad than there is in the United States. About a third of it's in the United States. The rest is abroad. And uh, there's even the talk, uh, there's even the, the new money's been printed, and there's talk of a two-tier currency. Uh, this whole idea of, of control of currency right. becomes a major, major political issue. Not understood by the rank and file. Uh, today's average citizen is less informed about money and currency than the than the, the traditional uh, citizens were of this country in its early years, where they had a huge distrust of shenanigans with our currency. But today, uh, not just the Federal Reserve, but the current uh, legislation in Congress is, is all moving towards those ingredients, those mechanisms that it will take to control the currency. You know, you mentioned technology. Jesus mentions of this end time period that unless they were interrupted, unless those days be shortened, uh, there would no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, uh, those days will be shortened, he says. It's interesting that uh, if you were talking about the 1400s or 1500, you know, in other words, in most of our history in the past, the technology was not around to wipe out all flesh on the planet Earth. It's interesting that the primary fear of people in strategic circles, in policy-level uh, situations today, 
is the reality that uh, the uh, the capability exists many times over to wipe out all flesh on the earth. It's interesting to look at these biblical prophecies. We take them so for granted today, but it's interesting that we live in a period uh, in which it's uniquely capable of being fulfilled, not just the currency in terms of the controls mentioned in Revelation 13, but also the nuclear yeah, threat that's true. mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39, and Zechariah 14 describes the neutron bomb, uh, and on it goes. So it's interesting as we watch the political maneuvering and the technological maneuvering, uh, we see it all... Uh, uh, right. uh, at, at, at one time, the scriptures would seem to have been describing things out of myth that you know several hundred years ago people could not have... Uh, conceived how this could have happened. Now this all seems very plausible, if not probable. Yeah, even in uh, Revelation uh, uh, 38 and 39, it uh, mentions that the weapons left over from that engagement will supply all the energy needs for the nation Israel uh, for seven years. Well, it's interesting that uh, the early commentators figured that's symbolic because nothing can burn for seven years. Well, we smile at that today because the kinds right. of weapons that we routinely use, uh, being nuclear, of course, could easily provide all the energy needs of a nation for seven years. In fact, we also discover that the production Soviet warhead, uh, the 10,000 or so that are on the black market today, have a shelf life of guess what seven years i wonder how uh, ezekiel knew that so, I, mean, <laughs> I, was to, I was going to say something cute there but I decided. <laughs> no it's interesting that we find that the more you study ezekiel 38 and 39 and the more you understand the the, the middle east situation today we see the, uh-huh. the stage set so while we see the ezekiel 38 thing ready to happen while we see the lineup of the nations under russia exactly as they're, they're described we, as while we find a superpower emerging in europe exactly like daniel 2 and 7 says it should not surprise us to see the mechanisms start to move that will set the stage for this a, a leader yet unidentified to our understanding emerge to take rulership of the world you know tomorrow we'll be talking about the abomination of desolation one of the things that uh, satan tends to follow as a pattern is uh, number one deceive number two use and number three trash so uh, it seems like Antichrist will follow that, that pattern. And on, on the day after, we'll be talking about could it happen in the world today? And that's important because we're, we've sort of touched on that today as to how will we make the transition. We can see it possible, but now how would that actually happen given the current structures? And, of course, a lot of that's conjecture. We know the end result. We know where we are, but we're not too sure about the interim sometimes. So we were going to talk about the abomination of desolation today, which uh, <laughs> Daniel talked about and. Yeah, and Christ talked about earlier in the week. We talked about uh, his characteristics, what his rule is going to be like, and we talked about the beast. And the yeah, I, I, I thought that we might uh, take a little different approach to this than is often taken. Uh, when we're reading the Gospel of John in John chapter ten, we have the famous uh, Good Shepherd discourse, and and uh, the Lord uh, uh, you know, goes into quite an ex- extended discourse. But right in the middle of this discourse, verse twenty two, throws in a footnote that uh, uh, if you're a normal, well adjusted uh, Bible reader, you keep just keep on reading. But if you're a Chuck Missler uh, Bible student, you're lo- no longer normal and well-adjusted. Because, of, <laughs> yeah, because in verse 22, it's after right in the middle of this discourse, it says, And it was at Jerusalem, uh-huh. the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter. And normally, it's got, you know, you say, well, what's that got to do with anything? It's just there. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, uh, if you've been to one of my Bible studies, you know that my premise is that every detail, every number, every word is there by design. So it's there for a purpose. The Holy Spirit put that there for a purpose. So it says it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication. Well, the first question is, what is the Feast of Dedication? And a little investigation will show that's clearly the dedication of the temple. But when you see that it was the Feast of Dedication and it was winter, uh, if you start studying that, that's puzzling because there's only been two temples. There was Solomon's Temple, the, so, the first and second temple. And the first one is dedicated in the fall, if you study that carefully. In, I think it's First Kings 6. Uh, 15 and uh, the second temple was dedicated in Ezra 6 uh, 15 too strange enough uh, it was dedicated in the spring so the first thing if you if you track that down you discover that this would seem like an error the feast of dedication and it was winter but I find this a very provocative illusion because here the Holy Spirit interestingly enough is authenticating a Jewish feast called Hanukkah the seven feasts of Moses, of course, are in the Torah, and we study those at great interest because all seven feasts are prophetic, not only historical. But we also, there are several other feasts that the Jews observe that, uh, are, are some, you know, that are not necessarily feasts of Moses, if you will. One of them is the Feast of Hanukkah, and it turns out that the Holy Spirit calls our attention to that. And one of the reasons I believe he does, because it celebrates or commemorates, if you will, an historic event 
that becomes the key to understanding end time prophecy. I think the the feast of Purim would be one of the other ones too. Because yes, that was, exactly. Okay, yeah. and, and but so it's interesting that four disciples came to Jesus Christ mm-hmm. for a confidential briefing uh, of his second coming, and uh, these four disciples, uh, Peter, uh, uh, James, and John, and also Andrew, ask him about a second coming, and the, the and Jesus gives them what I'll call a two chapter answer. This is recorded in three of the Gospels: right. Matthew twenty four and twenty five, Luke twenty one and twenty two, and Mark thirteen and fourteen. Uh, We'll just take the Matthew account as the exemplar one. In Matthew 24, Jesus responds to their inquiry by first mentioning some what I'll call non-signs. This and that will happen, but the end is not yet. But when we study this passage, we discover the key to its understanding is verse 15 of Matthew 24. Jesus says to his disciples, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place, and then there's a parenthetical remark, whosoever readeth, let him understand. It continues, Then let them who are in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him who is in the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him who is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto those who are with child and those, and to those who are, uh, that nurse children in those days. But pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day, and so on it goes. Now, it's interesting that he instructs his disciples, when they see this peculiar technical event called the abomination of desolation, they are to split and split now, like right away. So, we, because of the emphasis here, we have a great interest to understand what on earth is this peculiar term, the abomination of desolation. Well, the word abomination, biblically, refers to false worship, worship of idols. The abomination of desolation is the extreme form of that. It turns out that if you really want to offend God, you not only worship uh, something other than the living God, you worship an idol, but you erect that idol in the most sacred spot on the planet Earth. Not only in Jerusalem and and in the temple precincts, but actually in the Holy of Holies. And that has a technical term. We learn, by the way, from history, uh, as well as prophecy, because it did occur once before. It turns out, 200 years before Jesus made this remark, essentially, Mm -hmm. that event did occur. They were under Greek domination at the time. There was a leader that was Antiochus IV, who called himself Epiphanes, or the coming one. And he had it, uh, his ambition, among other things, was to offend the Jews. And he found, that he he devised a way to really make that happen. What he did was, he prohibited uh, the worship of Jewish uh, rituals, uh, the keeping of the Torah, uh, punishable by death. He forced them to offer pork in their offerings. Mm-hmm. He actually, uh, not only did he uh, uh, have uh, uh, pigs slaughtered on the holy altar in Jerusalem, he erected an idol to Zeus right in the Holy of Holies. And that, that led, of course, to the Maccabean Revolt, which they indeed threw off. The, by the way, the, he did that on his birthday. Most people don't realize that. The 24th of Kislev. But in any case, uh, that led to a revolt which successfully threw off the yoke of the uh, Seleucid Empire. And uh, three years on the anniversary of the desecration of that temple, by then the Jews had uh, the, uh, established their uh, ability to do so. They, cl- they destroyed all the in- implements that were used in that desecration. They made new ones. And they rededicated the temple on the 25th of Kislev. And that event is what is commemorated to this very day in their observance of their holiday known as Hanukkah. Now, don't confuse a lot of the colorful legends that surround it with the main purpose, which is to commemorate the dedication of the temple. And I'm intrigued that in the New Testament, in John 10.22, the Holy Spirit authenticates that in effect. Now, one reason is that uh, Jesus himself alludes to that historical event as indicative of a future event that is yet to happen. And uh, what we discover from John 9.27 that we looked at the other day is that in the middle of this seven-year period, this coming world leader is going to desecrate that temple. Now, this is um, amplified, if you will, in the passage we opened the series with in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, verse 4, if you recall, it spoke of the man of sin, the son of perdition, these titles, uh, two of the 13 titles of the New Testament of this guy, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, if you get into the technicalities of that passage, clearly there's no way to escape that what it's talking about is that he sets himself up personally in the Holy of Holies of a literal temple in Jerusalem. Let me ask you a minute, because yeah, I never right. here for a A lot of people 
people will talk about the the sacking of Jerusalem under Titus. Let's talk as about that because there's okay. a lot of misunderstanding about that. Okay, good. When, um, as you know, in 70 A.D., Titus Vespasian and the 5th, 10th, 12th, and 15th Roman legions laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And it was Titus' ambition to retain the temple as a trophy. Now, bear in mind, it almost took two years. There was a siege going on. People were, over a million people were slaughtered, men, women, and children, in Jerusalem during that war. as a war going on. During that engagement, a Roman soldier threw a torch, Josephus, eyewitnesses record all this, threw a torch through one of the windows which caused a fire inside the temple. The temple interior was wood overladen with gold. A fire started, which caused the gold to be melted. And Titus reluctantly had to give the orders to take it apart stone by stone to re re retrieve the gold. And uh, Jesus, 38 years earlier, had predicted that exact thing. But the point was, there was no time or opportunity to desecrate the temple in a ceremonial sense, it was destroyed during the, uh, the engagement. And many people try to make that event uh, fit uh, the abomination of desolation, but if you study the technicalities carefully, they don't fit. In fact, subsequent to that, a Caligula, uh, a, subsequent em a subsequent emperor, uh, gave the order to have his image put in the Holy of Holies. This was earlier. There weren't two Caligulas. No, there was one Caligula, <laughs> right, but he was earlier. He gave the order to have his image put in the Holy of Holies, uh -huh. and Petronius, the general, uh, started to do so and found out that uh, that would have caused a major uprising, right. so he declined to do that. It turned out when Caligula found out his orders weren't followed, he gave the order for Petronius to, put, to be put to death. But by a strange mix-up, uh, Caligula incidentally died a few weeks later. The, the message that Caligula died reached Ju Judea, before the order arrived to put Petronius to death, so he escaped that, that sentence. But it's interesting how the hand of God seems to intervene to prevent that from happening, simply because it is a milestone event that is yet future. The, the, the point that I really want to make is that Jesus, Paul, and John in the New Testament all make reference to this event, and that the, a temple is a prerequisite condition uh, for these prophecies. Today we're talking about the abomination of desolation. We were just talking about uh, Titus and Caligula. And you're saying so far, Chuck, that that is not the abomination of desolation, either under Antiochus Epiphanes, which happened mm -hmm. prior to the time of Christ, but that Christ was pointing to something much further in the future. Yeah, exactly. In fact, if you, if you study Matthew 24 in detail, you'll discover immediately after uh, that abomination of desolation, you have all kinds of climactic events which you, eat, which you are forced to allegorize rather than take literally. And that's the other aspect that one gets trapped into if one tries to make the AD 70 event somehow fit the abomination of desolation. Uh, but there's another aspect to this that might be worth mentioning. Because this event that occurs requires the desecration of a temple, uh, it's in, and, and of course, in Daniel nine, it makes it clear that's the the middle that's the event in the middle of the seven year period. Yeah, we don't have a temple yet. No, well, that's what's so interesting <laughs> is that for a, you know better part of almost two thousand years, the Jews since seventy since seventy A.D. Uh -huh. have not had a temple within which to worship. And of course, that's a major major a bone in the throat of Judaism, if you will, is that the temple is not standing, and uh, they are required under the sixteen uh, six hundred and thirteen uh, rules of Maimonides, etc., to seek and build the temple. So. It's interesting that one of the uh, most provocative events on our horizon is the are the preparations in Israel for the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, the Temple Institute has built 63 of the 103 implements uh, that they expect to be used in the in the service of the temple. Uh, they have uh, semi-automatic uh, looms weaving the linen for the priestly vestments. They've made the headdress and the breastplate with all the precious stones. You can go there and see them if you visit Israel. Uh, for the high priest. Uh, they have scientists scanning the world for the right marine snails to yield the Levitical blue and the royal purple. One of the interesting controversies uh, deals with the precise location of the temple. The traditional view, of course, is that it, it stood where the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim shrine, pleasant, presently stands, and many conservative rabbis still hold that view. But more and more research is beginning to cast doubts on that view. Almost 10 years ago, Dr. Asher Kaufman, of course, published the results of his studies, which suggested that the temple stood to the north about 100 meters. Mm -hmm. and that created quite a stir in the Christian community because it seems to open the door for what Revelation 11, the first few verses, imply. Uh, we might want to take a quick look at that. In, in John, the writer of the book of Revelation, in, in the first two verses of chapter 11, notes as follows. He says, There was given unto me a reed like a rod, 
And the angel stood saying, rise and measure, or reckon if you will, the temple of God and the altar and them that worship in it. Now the word temple there is now, it's the temple proper, not the total precincts, the temple itself. But verse 2 says, but the court which is outside the temple, that's what we would call the outer court, the court of the Gentiles, leave out, or in fact it says cast out in the Greek, and measure it not, for it is given unto the nations. And so it's interesting that uh, everybody's always assumed somehow that the Dome of the Rock, the sacred Muslim shrine, would somehow have to be dealt with in order to build the Jewish temple. And it's interesting that if Dr. Kaufman's conjectures were correct, that uh, the Dome of the Rock would sit in the outer court. And the theory that immediately emerges, maybe what's going to happen, is that the Jewish temple will be built in some manner so as not to disturb uh, the Dome of the Rock. Now, in more recent years, by the way, a more interesting discovery has been made. A guy by the name of Tuvia Sagiv, a friend of ours who's an architect in Jerusalem, is responsible for a number of studies that suggest, rather interestingly, that the, the, uh, both the First and Second Temple, Solomon's and, and uh, Nehemiah's Temple, if I can put it that way, mm-hmm. uh, stood in the, to the south about 100 meters. And uh, that raises all kinds of questions, but it turns out the more research that's going on, I won't get into all those technicalities here, but the point is the more you study this issue, the more it appears that Tuvia Segev is correct. There's a, it has to do with the elevation of the ground rock. It has to do with the feeding of the water from the aqueduct, which is there and surveyable. It has to do with a number of... Te- it, as you attempt to build a three-dimensional model of the Temple Mount, you encounter all kinds of conflicts with the ancient records unless you assume the Temple is a slightly lower elevation, which implies a slightly southerly, a southerly uh, location. Well, the interesting news in the last few weeks is that infrared photography on a flyby it shows several interesting things first of all there's a pentagonal structure underneath the dome of the rock and it turns out when you investigate the implications of that it implies that the rock that has uh, been so uh, sacred to the muslim interests is actually part of the antonia fortress which makes sense because the fossa or the moat which should be to the north of the antonia fortress not to the south for a lot of reasons but also, the same infrared photography also shows the semblance of a gate, the traditional Shushan gate or eastern gate that we all see when we visit Jerusalem is actually, of course, a Turkish gate built on top of a first century gate, but no one's sure exactly where the so-called eastern gate was. There's infrared indication that behind the Turkish wall that's presently there, there is a gate to the south. In other words, Tuvia's presentation implies that the Al-Khaz fountain, this fountain that's between the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, is the location of the Holy of Holies. So without getting into all that too much, the whole point is that current research is indicating that indeed, whether if Tuvia's right or Dr. Kaufman's right, it's interesting that in either case, there's a hint in Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2, that the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim shrines, are sitting in what actually was historically and presumably might be in the future, the outer court of the court of the Gentiles, which the book of Revelation indicates will remain undedicated. That the temple that's desecrated is the now is the temple proper. Okay, so I, I think if we look at the bottom line, uh, what people saw as the conflict is how are you going to rebuild the temple with Al-Aqsa Mosque sitting right there? Yes. But the answer is you might and not have rock, to, right. and the Dome of the Rock, yeah. right. You may not have to move the Dome of the Mo- Rock and the Mount. You may be able to build next exactly. to it. Now, all of this, of course, is not appealing to either the Jews or the Muslims. Right. The Jews are not excited about having Muslim shrines uh, that close to their temple, of course. And, of course, the Muslims are not excited about a Jewish presence in the middle of the Temple Mount area. Mm-hmm. But in the middle of all this, we find an interesting development taking place a move to internationalizing the Temple Mount. The uh, Muslims uh, worship it on Friday, the Jews, of course, on Shabbat or Saturday, and the Christians, in theory at least, would like to do it on Sunday. And, of course, in the, at uh, ten days after the Six-Day War, when uh, Israel regained biblical Jerusalem, the old city, ten days later, Moshe Dayan granted to the Muslims the control of the Temple Mount. That was his sort of land for peace gesture. And, of course, in recent years, the Muslims have got increasingly belligerent about uh, uh, freedom on the Mount. So there are, the Knesset and others are starting to get more and more antagonistic about it. The theory is that the uh, uh, Pope the Pope has raised his hand to administer the Temple Mount on an international basis. Well, they've talked about Jerusalem becoming an open city. An open a, city. Or a world city. And one of the theories that one, could, one of the conjectures that's emerging, of course, is the possibility that uh, as they do so, there may be some kind of political circumstance which might allow a Jewish presence on the, on the Temple Mount. And that 
would have its ultimate destiny being the desecration by this coming world leader who will be accepted by Israel as a Messiah, but of course will turn out to be the false Messiah and the man of sin, the son of perdition, etc. How realistic do you think this temple reconstruction is going to be? What's it going to take to, uh, well, I, to make it happen? There are lot, I personally think mm -hmm. if a political window opens up for them to do it, it'll happen very, very quickly. Even uh -huh. Solomon's temple was built off-site and brought to it so that no sound of no tools would be heard in the mount, if you recall the Old mm -hmm. Testament narrative. Mm -hmm. With modern tilt-up technologies and so forth, I suspect that given the opportunity politically that it could surface very quickly and in much more robust terms than most people would have any idea. You know, we were uh, researching a book that we published called The Coming Temple some years ago, and I had a uh, interesting conversation with Rabbi Chaim Richman at the Temple Institute, because while doing our researches, we discovered they have a wiring diagram for The Coming Temple. And I turned to uh, Rabbi Richman and I says, I, I'm, I'm puzzled. You've got uh, scientists scanning the world for these snails. You go, you go to all these extremes to be truthful, or faithful, I should say, to the ancient records, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the Mishnah, and the Tesefta. And you've got a wiring diagram? And he says, Chuck, you have to understand that we're, we're, where the scripture speaks, we try to be faithful to it. But where it's silent, we feel free to exploit any technologies available. Because after all, we're building a temple for the future, not the past. Well, I responded. I said, uh, well, then you're going to have uh, wiring for television. And he looked at me sort of startled. I said, sure, because Jesus in Matthew 24, 15 instructs all those that are in Judea when they see the abomination of desolation, which by definition occurs in the Holy of Holies. When all those in Judea see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place, uh, then all them in Judea are to flee and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, how can someone that's in Judea see what's going on in the Holy of Holies? And the answer, of course, is on CNN. Well, he didn't think that was very funny, but I, uh, the point is, it's interesting, in Matthew 24, 15, if you look at it carefully, it implies that the residents, the casual workers on the, hoof to, in the, on the rooftops or in the fields, uh -huh. will somehow be aware of a political event that is occurring within the confines of the Holy of Holies, and of course, it's the uh, coming world leader presenting himself by that time as the God to be worshipped. Which is the way he would have to do that. Exactly. As opposed to when Christ came. As somebody once said, uh, Christ is coming in the air, not on the air. Well, <laughs> yes, very good. I like that. I like that. But it's interesting uh, that uh, uh, that Paul warns us uh -huh. that uh, in the same Thessalonians passage we looked at before, verse 9 says, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power uh -huh. and signs and lying wonders. He's going to do miracles. And with all deceivable and unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, and so forth. Now, it's interesting that the only protection any of us have in not being deceived is to be in Jesus Christ. This, the protection we need is spiritual, not intellectual. You can learn all the mechanics you like, but unless you're in Jesus Christ, you'll be vulnerable to this delusion that is going to be satanic and it's going to deceive the whole world except for those that are uh, in Jesus Christ. Chuck, this week we looked at, uh, you know, yesterday, as a matter of fact, we were talking about the abomination of desolation and the rebuilding of the temple on the Temple Mount, which we determined probably might not have to happen uh, on the site of the Dome of the Rock, where Al-Aqsa Mosque is now located. Yeah, yesterday we talked, of course, about the uh, uh, Dome of the Rock and the traditional sites. And uh, the interesting thing, of course, is that technology is being uh, applied, ground-penetrating radar, uh, infrared photography, etc., to try to unravel this mystery. But, and without getting into those controversies, the exciting thing is that preparations are well underway uh, to rebuild. Uh, there are 200 young men in training to be priests. And uh, uh, with your fondness of puns, I'll point out, uh, John, they, of course, have Levi jeans. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the point is, they're serious. And there are, people, there are several, a number of different groups, about seven different groups in Israel, that are actively preparing in expectation of an opportunity to rebuild uh, the temple. So uh, that, of course, is a prerequisite condition to this uh, act of desecration called the abomination of desolation in the middle of that seven-year period that is defined, of course, by the coming world leader enforcing a treaty. Now, as we talk about uh, this leader, of course, there are many people 
uh, that believe he's alive today somewhere. And that, of course, gives rise to speculations. And, of course, these speculations started way back in the first century. Mm -hmm. There were all kinds of uh, people that believed it was Nero for various reasons. And if you go through the various uh, centuries, uh, the 20 centuries or so, um, you can find uh, people around all the time that had various theories as to what, who, what his identity was, who he might be, etc. Well, some people are saying that the book of Revelation was actually fulfilled in the first century. Well, that's, uh, I believe, easily disputed. In fact, I think right now we're going through uh, uh, the book of Revelation with our K-Ration subscribers, and I think clearly the book of Revelation is prophetic. Clearly the role of Israel uh, is essential to much of what tr transpires and, and, uh, and so forth. So uh, uh, that's a whole dispute that we could tackle on another day, but I think the book of Revelation clearly is prophetic, and uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 uh, deals with those things that come after these things, metatauta, which it refers to chapters 2 and 3. Mm -hmm. Book of Revelation has a divinely inspired outline in verse 19 of chapter 1, which lays out its structure. And clearly, events from chapter 4, verse 1 on are post-church. And in fact, it's interesting, in the book of Revelation, we find an emphasis on the distinction between Israel and the church. And we'll deal with that um, later in the program. But right now, the, the subject you've opened, John, is this identity of this guy. And I think most books that are written, uh, people talk about, uh, somehow link his identity with this uh, cryptic allusion in uh, Revelation thirteen eighteen, 18, uh, the 666, that mm -hmm. somehow this number is identified Yeah, the with microchip, him. take it on your hand. Yes, and right. I, I'm, I've spent 30 years in the computer industry, so I'm well acquainted with the technology, and indeed, these implantable chips may, in fact, very much turn out to be somehow involved. Uh, the other thing that comes up a lot, we, we see all these strange caricatures on some of the cartoons with guys with barcodes on their heads and so forth, right. because indeed, it is provocative that the codes that are used in barcodes have separators at the beginning and the end in the middle. And the number six has been selected as a convenient separator in the very, there's many, many different styles and conventions for barcodes, but this six as a separator is widely used. And of course, many people make much of the fact, it is kind of intriguing, that in the barcoding that's get, becoming so prevalent on the international product scene today, uh, that the six, uh, three sixes are very much part of it. But its they internal. don't register when the number is read, they're just, they're uh, they're used for the scanning technology right, to do yeah. the separations. But it's right. interesting that somehow the, the three sixes are thus uh, at least cryptically identified with the barcoding thing. So many people make much of that. I think it's interesting, but I think too much is made because, first of all, John, I happen to be among those that think that this whole uh, mark of the beast is widely misunderstood. I don't disparage or doubt that the, uh, the electronic technology will be involved in transactions and the political control of the world leader of this transaction system will be a major uh, source of his political and economic power. But I think the mark of the beast is misunderstood because it's his mark, not ours, that's being discussed. In other words, uh, what these people apparently do in Revelation uh, thirteen eighteen is they take on a deliberate commitment to identify with this world leader. Mm -hmm. And it's that commitment that becomes an automatic disqualification for salvation. The shocking thing in the scripture is that during that period of time, during his reign, there's a very specific act that, w that is uh, beyond repentance, that is beyond uh, repair. If someone uh, that agrees to identify with this world leader, he thus becomes irrevocably identified with the forces that are anti-God. So the first point to recognize is that uh, what we're talking about here is the acceptance of an identity. Now, to get at that, I think it's instructive to take a look at the only physical description we have of this coming world leader that I'm aware of. And that turns out to be in the Old Testament in Zechariah chapter 11, verse 17, which reads as follows. Woe to the idle shepherd. Now, the word idle here is I-D-O-L. In other words, the, the false worship type of shepherd. In other words, a false shepherd, if you will. Woe mm -hmm. to the idle mm -hmm. shepherd that leaveth the flock. Now, this is one of those illusions, incidentally, that's another reason that many scholars see him as a Jew, or I might say in a sense, an ex-Jew, in the sense that he, he uh, uh, leaves the flock. He somehow is apostate. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. And then we have a strange sentence. It says, the sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be completely dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Now, this is pretty interesting to me because, uh, first of all, we know from uh, other scriptures, many of them, that this uh, world leader suffers a head wound 
is apparently thought to be dead, but uh, is apparently resurrected. I say apparently because theologians will argue that he really isn't dead because only Jesus has the, the keys of hell and of death. But, uh, but whether it's a simulation or not doesn't matter because it, dece it succeeds in deceiving the whole world. The point is, it would seem from this passage that a vestige of that head wound is that he's lost the use of one arm and, uh, and, and his right eye will be uh, darkened. And it's a speculation, of course, but it would seem that possibly this is a vestige of that um, uh, event. Now, if that's the case, then it wouldn't surprise us that his followers, his lo the people who are loyal to him, would adopt some kind of emblem or marking that would cause them to be identified with him. And maybe that's the reason it's on the forehead, if you will, and their, and their arm is because that is somehow um, stylistically uh, the, me the mechanic that's used for the general population to identify uh, with his leadership. Because you realize some people don't have arms. But everybody's got a head. Yes. Well, that's the, that's the argument that's used for <laughs> transactions is right. that the convenient place would be on the wrist or something. And, that's, and that may turn out to be uh, 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 what is, in fact, implied here. But I, can't, I find it provocative to realize that in Revelation 13, 18, the identity that people take with this leader is accompanied by uh, Zechariah eleven seventeen that he apparently suffers from one eye being darkened and, uh, and uh, his arm uh, being withered. So uh, it's just a suggestion. I do think it's significant that in the Torah, see, there's no blasphemy, there's, no, uh, there's nothing in the Scripture that is not anticipated by the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting that in Leviticus and so forth, there's a prohibition against taking a mark on your body. My apologies to those of you that may have tattoos and things, but technically you're violating the Torah. So you will not find an Orthodox Jew taking on tattoos. And I think the, uh, the fact that we are not to take marks on our bodies is anticipatory in, in a sense of uh, these marks that are uh, so prominent in the, uh, re in the Revelation narrative. And some people had actually said if, if it were, you, you talked about these barcodes, it could actually be uh, infrared sensitive dye. Or ultraviolet sensitive dye, so it doesn't show up normally. It would Could very well up, be, but know. see, to me, John, that misses the point. The whole concept in Revelation thirteen eighteen is that these people openly identify with the leader, right? And I think they take a mark that people recognize, just as uh, someone might take a certain uniform or, or wear a certain necktie yeah. or something to identify with this worldwide Superman. That every now, uh, there's a, well, if you, if you remember in the days of the Roman Empire, the test, the the, the test that the Christians always flunked is the fact that they could not offer sacrifice to the emperor. In other words, that was the act that was required to uh, to prove that you were a loyal citizen of Rome. It wasn't right being citizens of Rome that, that shot them down. It was the fact that to prove that, you had to burn a little bit of sacrifice at the emperor, and they couldn't do that. Well, let's see. I, I'm trying to think where we should pick this up. Oh, the other thing on the 666, as we were talking about that during one of the breaks. Um, the 666, uh, there's also uh, another element that is overlooked, I think. You know, generally, when, you ju when we jump in the book of Revelation, we take as our point of departure the fact that it's in code, but every code is explained somewhere else in the Scripture. Mm -hmm. And we apply that th fairly consistently throughout the book. But it's interesting, when we get to Revelation thirteen eighteen, we encounter the 666, we seem to throw that principle out the window. If we apply that principle, if we look through the Scripture to see where 666 appears, with one uh, textual problem I'll dismiss it for the moment, it only appears twice, and it's the salary of Solomon. And it's always mentioned incident to the visit of the Queen of Sheba, the Queen of the Covenant. But it's interesting that uh, there are some that see the 666 linked to Solomon. It's also interesting, by the way, that the Magan David, the familiar symbol of Judaism that appears on the flag of Israel, is actually not traceable earlier than the 14th century as a sign of uh, uh, as the Magan David or the Shield of David. That in fact uh, it has surfaced as a symbol of Judaism only in relatively recent years. If we study the origins of that symbol, we discover they show up in the Jewish occult, and they're known as the Seal of Solomon. You're talking about the Kabbalah. Well, Kabbalah and yeah, in, 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 and and other uh, Jewish occultic uh, sources, mm -hmm. and it's uh, 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 one place that's a historic uh, example is where it's used, involved with some incant uh, incantations for preventing pregnant uh, miscarriages and things. So the point is uh, the the uh, the six sided, six figured symbol that makes up Israel. Uh, there are some that wonder if, as as history moves on, that it may not surface as as uh, somehow linked uh, to this uh, this coming world leader. 
the whole role of Solomon in the scripture is provocative. If you study Revelation 7, you know that the tribe of Dan is, not, is left unsealed in, in chapter 7 because uh, Dan was the tribe through which idolatry entered the land. Well, Solomon was the king through which idolatry entered the land. It didn't start with Jeroboam. Uh, it, it, it actually, it was introduced uh, through Solomon and his foreign wives. So there are some uh, mystics or scholars that's, that speculate that maybe uh, these allusions have yet to be fully understood or fully explored. The other thing that you encounter that is provocative is the, the fact that in the book of Daniel, uh, in Daniel 8, but mostly in Daniel 11, we find a strange merging of the texts that allude to the, uh, the Greek ruler, the Seleucid Empire, the Antiochus Epiphanes, and the uh, prophecies of the end times. And uh, there, uh, some scholars have speculated, maybe with some justification, that there is a bloodline, there is a, a the genealogical linkage between not only Antiochus Epiphanes, but uh, these various uh, allusions uh, in Daniel, like in Daniel 9 with the Roman leader. Well, it turns out that if we study carefully... Uh, the legacies after Alexander the Great, uh, and when he when his when he died at the age of 33, and his empire broken up broke up uh, among the four generals. The key ones biblically are Seleucus and Ptolemy, and their careers are detailed in the Book of Daniel. And of course, uh, the prim, the prim, the uh, principal one that we get interested in, of course, is Antia, Antiochus the Fourth, who called himself Epiphanes. Um, uh, it turns out it's interesting that not uh, not only did he was he the principal one that desecrated the temple in the uh, abomination of desolation uh, uh, back in uh, uh, that period, and that we talked about uh, earlier. But it's interesting that his successors get intermarried and get very prominent in the succeeding empire, the Roman Empire. It's possible that the uh, uh, see the there seems to be a link, uh, a genealogical link that you can trace between Antioch's Epiphanes and Titus Vespasian. And it's interesting that uh, Titus Vespasian, of course, becomes the uh, nominal person that he's the he's it's his soldiers that destroy the temple according to you know that is prophesied in Daniel uh, 9 24 through 27 the, the 70 week prophecy well it's interesting that Antioch Epiphanes genealogy links you to um, that particular uh, uh, a leader that is the you know, that becomes an exemplar if you will mm -hmm. of the prince that shall come well what's interesting is that uh, you can continue to trace successors that even took the title of Prince Epiphanes um, right on through. Tacitus talks about it, and Josephus talks about it. This goes, strangely enough, it would seem, all the way to the Merovingian uh, dynasty from about 458 on. What's interesting about that particular dynasty is that it was very much involved with the occult and the worship of Satan and such. And this dynasty can be traced to uh, uh, virtually all the heads of Europe, primarily through the House of Habsburg, uh, which, of course, has genetic ties to virtually every ruling house in Europe. And, of course, its most important luminaries are Otto von Habsburg, who, incidentally, I had lunch with, uh, Otto von Habsburg of Austria, and his son, Carl, and, of course, also King uh, Juan Carlos I of Spain and his son, Philippe. And that's where many people get these ideas that out of these linkages may come the Antichrist. Now, it's, it's interesting. One of King uh, Juan Carlos's titles is still King of Jerusalem. It's one of the titular... Uh, yes, that was carried way, way back. And, and this gets tangled up with the Knights Templars. There's a whole occultic, not only a background, but an occultic background that goes right. on back for centuries. I was going to say a titular title, but that doesn't sound right. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's sort of like a self-descriptive <laughs> item, yeah, right? right. <laughs> there is a missing link of about 378 years that doesn't quite uh, tie well. Uh, but it's interesting also that uh, there are occultic groups, substantial ones, widespread, that hold the view that the the uh, uh, Morovis rule links back to offspring of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. Now that, of course, is blasphemous, and that uh, obviously is not true. But it's interesting that large occultic groups throughout history hold that view and ascribe that genealogy to this genetic line. And uh, so it's uh, it's it's possible. That uh, somewhere along the way, there may, these missing links may surface. Not to that, of course, but to the back to the the, the, the tie that to uh, Antioch Epiphanes, which uh, uh, which then would tie the end the 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 last half of Daniel 11 to the first half from verses uh, after verse 45, 36 on to the the verses uh, earlier. So um, now. 
we're getting uh, into a lot of technicalities here, and they're provocative, but we should emphasize something that's very, very important. Uh, I hold the view that from uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that there is a very important prerequisite condition to this guy being revealed. You know, it's interesting to talk about these different descendancies and so mm-hmm. forth. It's interesting to go through all these different, different people's speculations. But there is a prerequisite condition to the revelation of the Antichrist, and, uh, or as we call him, the coming world leader, as I prefer to call him. And that is in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. We might, that's where we started this whole series. Uh, we might take a look at that because that, in, that includes a prophetic passage that I think is absolutely essential for us as Christians to, to recognize. Um, Paul, of course, is reminding them in this passage things he taught them in the first three weeks of, uh, of their Christian walk, by the way. But when we get to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6, Paul reminds them, he says, And now ye know what restraineth that he might be revealed in this time, meaning the Antichrist be revealed. There's something that restrains the Antichrist being revealed. He says, For the mystery of iniquity hath already work, only he who now hindereth will continue to hinder until he be taken out of the way. And uh, and then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and uh, shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, it's interesting that there is a restrainer. And, of course, different authorities have different theories as to who the restrainer is. But this restrainer restrains sin. And if you do a careful biblical study, the only one that restrains sin, it's never Michael the archangel or any of these others, the only one that restrains sin is the God himself, God the Holy Spirit. And uh, for lots of reasons, uh, we hold the, the only thing that fits this passage, when you look at the Greek carefully, is that this is the Holy Spirit being removed in, and the problem, uh, and, and incidentally, the, the, what this leads to is a view that a prerequisite condition to the revealing of the Antichrist is the rapture, the snatching away, the catching out of the church. Many people have trouble with that, but most people have trouble with the rapture. It's not a problem in eschatology or prophecy of the end times. It's more a problem of ecclesiology. It's amazing how many Christians have not really done their homework to really understand the mystery of the church and how the church is distinct from believers both before and subsequent. That it enjoys some very unique privileges that are all bound up in the fact that the Holy Spirit indwells the church. And it's that removal that Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians 4 and uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, the end of both of those chapters. But I, uh, from this passage, uh, uh, and I think it takes a careful exegesis of this passage to really get command of this topic, but the point is that if we understand 2 Thessalonians too carefully then it would seem that a prerequisite condition to this world leader being revealed publicly is the church has to be out of here. Now that leads into some interesting timing. The Great Tribulation is the last half of a seven-year period that's defined by a treaty that he enforces, this coming world leader enforces. That treaty can't be enforced until he's in power. He can't be in power until sometime after he's publicly revealed. That might be one day or it might be 30 years. The point is, I think the rapture precedes the 70th week of Daniel by some distance. Now this leads to another principle that one needs to be very careful about and don't believe it because I tell you, do it because you find out yourself about the distinctiveness between Israel and the church. There's much confusion about that rampant today. The 70 weeks of Daniel are expressly uh, focused on, it says, uh, uh, 77 is already determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. So it's very Jewish. The church appears between in that interval between the 69th and 70th week. And uh, the church has to be removed, I believe, before the 70th week can... Uh, uh, can begin. So that's a, we've obviously been rather cavalier on a lot of complex topics here, but I think we need to recognize, first of all, that it's really fruitless to speculate on specific identities. I don't, I don't think Clinton's the Antichrist. I don't think Rush Limbaugh's the Antichrist or Newt Gingrich. <laughs> we can joke about all those things. The truth of the matter is he won't be revealed while the church is present in the world. But I do think that it's uh, important for us to recognize that our only protection from being deceived is the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And it's time to do our homework and very carefully, with fear and trembling, uh, understand uh, these things and understand that uh, we look to uh, His uh, appearing.
Don't think Henry Kissinger, huh? No, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I think we should recognize that this man will be destroyed when Jesus Christ, his, his career is interrupted by the Lord returning. Uh, he Interestingly, he and the sidekick, the false prophet, both get cast in the lake uh, of fire. And a thousand years later, Satan's not there yet. His two cohorts are preceded by a thousand years, but they're still alive in the lake of fire after the thousand years are finished. Our hope and our focus needs to be uh, not on the Antichrist, but on the real Christ, the living God, the one who created us all. He was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. He's what it's all about. And having said that, we've covered a lot of territory on this week. We've done a whole series on the uh, coming world leader, the overview of the coming world leader, characteristics, uh, what will his rule be like, what is the abomination of desolation, and uh, how could this happen in the world today? This has been a whole week of special Grand Adventure broadcasts. On behalf of Chuck Missler, this is John Leffler. <laughs>